Yes. Okay, so this is the second lecture, and today the main subject of our study is going to be the irreducible representation as building blocks. Okay, so uh, let me remind you briefly of what we learned last time. Uh, we consider, well, we also consider methane, but this one is a bit easier. We consider the deuterated methane, this molecule, and at the beginning of the lecture, I told you that if you know group theory, you could predict that there would be three non-degenerate frequencies, vibrational frequencies, plus three doubly degenerate vibrational frequencies for a total of six different frequencies, okay? Excuse I also, uh, yes. Uh, are the slides, do, do you already show the slides? I don't see the slides right now. Uh, everyone else see you, the you cannot see this. I'm sharing, let me see. Uh, Maya, can you see the slide? No, no, there are no slides. Oh, okay, 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 I see. Because I forgot to... Okay, let me see. Now... Yes, uh, perfect. Is, is okay now? Yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I thought... I, I forgot to press the button to share. Okay. Okay, I also told you something about the activity, Raman activity, infrared activity, but this you will learn in the fourth lecture. In the second lecture, lecture, you will learn how to compute this, how to obtain this from scratch, just from looking at the molecule and using some tables that I'm going to share with you. Okay, so basically, uh, the reason we know that there are three non-degenerate frequencies and three W degenerate frequencies is because we have been able to compute, well, we will be able today to compute the decomposition of the vibrational representation. Uh, the vibrational representation is going to be three times A1. So this will be three frequencies. The multiplicity is the number of frequencies. And since A1 has dimension one, they are going to be non-degenerate. This is also three times E. So th three different frequencies. Each of them doubly degenerate because E has dimension two. So you see that basically, in, in order to make predictions, we only need two things. We must be able to decompose the relevant representation. In this case, we want to know the non zero frequencies. So this is the vibrational representation, as we'll see in more detail. And then, uh, once I know how to decompose, I just have to use Wigner's theorem. Wigner's theorem is just this, that tells you that the multiplicity is the number of associated frequencies, different associated frequencies to that irreducible representation. And then the dimension is the degeneracy. So there are just basically two ingredients. Now, looking at this table, I remind you also that on the left-hand side, you have representations that have a very clear physical meaning. For instance, V, is a three-dimensional representation that tells you how physical three-dimensional vectors transform under the operations of the group, under rotations, reflections, etc. Okay. R has an equally clear transparent meaning. It's the same thing for pseudo vectors, like the magnetic field, magnetization, how they transform under the operations of the group, symmetry group. M is the mechanical representation also with a clear meaning. Uh, our molecule has 15, uh, sorry, five atoms. So any deformation of the molecule is specified by giving the, the 
displacement of each atom. So this is three times five. This is, I have to give 15 numbers. So this is a 15 dimensional vector in a vector space. So how these 15 dimensional vectors transform under the operation of the group is described by 15 by 15 matrices, which constitute the mechanical representation. And finally, if from the mechanical representation, I get rid of the zero modes, which are just global translations and global rotations of the molecule, which obviously they are not vibrations. So I just subtract these representations, then I obtain this, okay? So basically, this we already know. Uh, we know that this by inspection, but then I'll tell you how to do this uh, in a mechanical or automatic way, okay? If we know this, this, and this decomposition, immediately we obtain this and we know the answer for the spectrum, okay? Uh, now, uh, so today we have to learn a little bit more about these irreps, irreducible representations, which are abstract objects. I mean, they are just sets of matrices of dimension one, dimension one, or dimension two that satisfy the rule, the composition rule of the group. Okay, but they are abstract. In principle, they can be applied to any system, whereas these things are much more concrete. It's, it's to a, this to a particular molecule, this to a particular kind of objects, which are vectors, etc. Okay, so uh, the only representation we have studied so far is the vector representation that tells you how ordinary vectors transform under the elements of the symmetry group. These are the symmetry uh, group is C3D or 3M for those who are more used to the crystallographic notation. And these are the elements, the identity element, which shouldn't be confused with the E, E rep, is a visible representation, have nothing to do. These rotations counterclockwise, clockwise of 120 degrees around the center, which obviously are symmetries of the molecule, and then these three reflection planes. Now, if you want to construct any representation, a representation is a set of matrices. And of course, matrices depend on the coordinate system you use. So the matrices that I'm going to show you are valid only for this coordinate system, X parallel to sigma D1, Y, and then Z perpendicular to the plane, okay? And then, uh, well, these are the matrices. Uh, they tell you how vectors transform, in fact, I think one of the is the first exercise uh, that I'm going to give you for the problem in the problem set. It, you will obtain this. I'll give you a recipe, but probably you know already. Uh, some of them are very easy to obtain. These are rotations, the general formula for rotation with the cosine and the sine. This is also very easy because this plane is parallel to the. Sorry, I, I don't remember how this works. This plane, yeah, this plane is sigma d1 which is parallel to the x-axis. So this contains the x and z-axis, they are not reversed, but the y-axis, which is perpendicular, is reversed by a reflection. So obviously I have minus one, one for x and z and minus one. So they are obvious, these are not so obvious, and I'll, I'll give you a recipe to, to construct this. And now the thing is that just by inspection, we see that these things have a block diagonal structure, okay? And this means that the vector representation decomposes into two irreducible representations. One corresponds to this box, which is a very trivial representation, is the identity representation. If you just give one assign one to each element of the group, of course, this trivially satisfies the group structure. Then the two-dimensional is not so trivial, but it's here, and it's called E, okay? Now, the trouble is that in order to see this, you have to be lucky enough that you choose the appropriate coordinate system. <clears throat> the coordinate system where the reducible structure is obvious is usually called the symmetry adapted system or symmetry adapted coordinates. But usually you are not so lucky, okay? So we need more powerful methods to decide whether a given representation is reducible or irreducible. And in case it's reducible, we need a method that give, gives us the decomposition, okay? In this case, this is obvious. 
this irreducible representation is defined on the z axis and this is defined on the x y axis on the x y plane both the z axis and the plane are invariant soft spaces why because if you start with a vector in either of these spaces it always stays in the same space there is no element in the group that takes you away from the axis or from the plane okay so irreducible representations are always associated to invariant soft spaces which are not decomposable okay these invariant subspaces shouldn't have any invariant space so for instance if i take this plane xy is obvious that any vector that is on the xy plane if i rotate it around the z axis or if i reflect it stays in the same plane and there is not invariant of space from the plane any axis that i take there is always the rotation symmetry that takes us away from it okay so Irreducible representation is a representation which is defined in a invariant subspace which doesn't have other invariant subspaces. Okay, this is kind of a bit more formal uh, definition, which is not terribly important. Sorry. Yes. Hello. Uh, can can I ask a question about this example? Yes. 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 So, <clears throat> for what I understood, uh, representation uh, you uh, associate uh, linear operators. Yes. But um you don't say anything about what they act on so yeah. uh I, I was thinking here we chose like three-dimensional space because it's it's logical like i have a three-dimensional system so i use x y and z but for example i could uh, label each vertex of uh, the the triangle with for example uh, zero one one zero one one and then I would need only two by two matrices, and I would need just three matrices if I, uh, because I just need to swap the vertices. That's so awesome. I. Yeah. No, no, please go. So, on. What? Sorry. Yeah, uh, go on, please. Yeah. yeah so uh, I don't. Uh, so I, I need less matrices than what you wrote, but as my understanding, they should describe the same thing, which is weird to me. Well, uh, I mean, the point is, uh, no, it's, it's a very good question. And this is only, I mean, the physical insight, I mean, group theory is simple. I mean, the theory is simple. Uh, the formulas are very simple, uh, operations. What is not so simple is how to use it wisely. Okay, you have to be wise when you use it. And sometimes this is a bit hard. Uh, in this case, it's true that if you are just interested in the vertices of the molecule, you can do some kind of two-dimensional representation. However, that's not what you are trying to describe. What you are trying to describe in the case of the vector representation are displacements of an atom. And now, if you want to describe the possible displacements of an atom, you need, really need three components because the vector can be oriented in any direction in three-dimensional space. So uh, I don't know if that answers your, your question. It depends on what you want to describe. Here, I want to describe vibrations. Vibrations are described by three-dimensional vectors for each atom. So that uh, tells me that necessarily has to be three-dimensional. Uh, sometimes I'm only interested, for instance, in how the atoms are permute among themselves. Then it's in the group is different, it's the permutation group, the dimension is different. So it depends on what is the object of your interest. Since here we are going trying to make predictions about the vibrational spectrum, I need to be able to describe arbitrary displacement. So that's why uh, the, represent the, the relevant representation is the vector representation. Does it answer your question or? Mm. Yes, yes. So, so, so uh, in this sense, this 3D uh, representation is more complete than the other one. That's right. And you will see that in, uh, sometimes you even have a choice, okay? Um, later on, when we study more complicated systems, depending on, on the level of detail, you, you even may have a choice. But uh, this is, I mean, I chose uh, molecular vibrations because uh, it's very clear everything and it's very, okay? Well, so. Uh, yeah, thank you. 
Okay, so going back to the reducible and irreducible representations, the problem we found is the following. I gave you these matrices. These matrices, they don't have a block diagonal structure. However, I know how I, how I constructed these vertices. I see them. What I did is I took the previous matrices and I just made a similarity transformation on them. But of course, the representation is exactly the same. A similarity transformation means that I'm just using different axes, different coordinate system. And indeed, this is still reducible. There are some invariance of spaces, but the invariance of spaces have a very weird description in this coordinate system. So this means that I cannot depend on looking at the matrices. First, constructing the matrices is usually quite complicated. If you want to construct 15 by 15 matrices, it's a mess. And secondly, uh, you should try infinitely many similarity transformations to see if one of the infinitely many transformations gives you a block diagonal structure. That's absolutely hopeless. So that's where you really need formal group theory. Okay? Uh, if you don't know group theory, you are completely lost in this case. And what is the formal group theory that you need? Well, I am going to give you only the results. These results depend on several theorems and lemmas. If you are studying any of the books that I told you or any other book, then you will know what is behind, but you don't need it at all to be able to use group theory. Also, if you want to use it professionally, I mean, if you want to use it for your research, you should know also the, the formal stuff because that gives you security and you won't make very bad blunders that you can make if, if you really don't know what is behind, okay? Now, this has to do with the following thing. In this case, we have two representations, apparently different, but they were related by a similarity transformation, by a non-singular matrix, okay? If the matrix is singular, that would change the dimensionality, and they, of course, they cannot be equivalent. So, by definition, two representations are equivalent if they are related by a non-singular matrix. This means they are related by a change of coordinates, a change of reference frame. In our case, you can check that this is the similarity transformation, the change of basis that I use. I chose it on purpose so that it would scramble completely the block structure of the vector representation. And this can be interpreted as a change of coordinates with u prime equal a u, x prime equal x, y prime, etc. Okay, if I have time later on, I will, on the blackboard, I will make a few clarifications that in my experience, people, many people get extremely confused. Uh, many people initially, I mean, there is a confusion between coordinates and vectors, coordinates and unit vectors, transformation of unit vectors, transformations, of coordinates. This is a nightmare when you start to, uh, to use group theory, but I think it can be clarified very simply, but I, I'll do it at the end if I have time. If not, I'll do it next time because I want to give all the material. Okay, so W and V is just uh, the same, okay? Just different coordinate system. And now, this kind of hopeless. I mean, the, the shape of the matrices changes completely when I change coordinate system. So I have to graph something which doesn't change. And that's very simple. You remember that under a similarity transformation, traces are invariant. So if I look at the traces of my representation, then I know that this is a characteristic of the representation which is independent completely of the coordinate system, okay? So as a consequence, equivalent representations have identical traces. Now, well, I call this the converse, this is not a very, very, maybe very correct. What I mean by this is that the following. It, from this formula, it is obvious that equivalent representations have identical traces. But the opposite, I mean, the fact that if two representations have all the traces equal, they are equivalent, is also true. This is non-trivial statement and a very powerful statement and you need several lemmas and theorems to arrive at this conclusion, okay? So if you are studying the formal group theory, you will know why. If you are not, well, this is true and it's just easy to remember. 
if you have two representations and the traces for all the group elements are the same, necessarily the representations are equivalent. Necessarily there is behind some similarity transformation relating there, okay? So I have this equivalence. Two representations are equivalent if and only if all the traces are equal. It has to be not just for one group element, for all the group elements. So a representation is thus fully characterized by the set of traces of the elements of the group G. So since they characterize the representation, the set of traces for all the elements of the group is known as the character of the representation P, okay? So another very common mistake when somebody starts to study group theory. Sometimes people think that a character is a trace. No, a character is a set of all the traces for all the elements of the group. Why? Because the representation is characterized only if you know all the traces. Two representations can have some common traces for let's say half of the elements, but the others are different. We'll see many examples of this. Then they are not equivalent, okay? But this is the, one of the most important results in group theory, that a representation is completely characterized by the traces of all the elements, and this is known as the character of the representation. So this is an example. This is the A1 representation. We already knew it. It was one for all the elements. They are one by one matrices. The character are just one, 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 one. A2, we haven't seen it yet, uh, but we'll see it. It appears in the rotational representation. And well, this is one for the proper elements. These are proper because they are just identity or, or pure rotations. These are improper elements because uh, they include mirrors. In general, they are products of the inversion for some proper uh, operation, okay? And, well, for this, this is minus one, minus one, minus one. And then the E representation, uh, we already know because we saw the matrices, they are two by two matrices, and the vector representation, you also know. Okay, in fact, by going to the previous slide, uh, you take these traces for these blocks and you find the traces for the E representation. And you take the whole trace and you find the traces for the vector representation, okay? So you can, could construct just from this set of matrices. Something very important. The vector representation is the sum, the direct sum of the A1 representation represented by this block and the E representation represented by this block. You see that if you take the trace of the vector representation, the trace of the vector representation is the trace of the E representation plus the trace of the A1 representation. I mean, when a representation is the sum of two representations, it means that these things are block, they are diagonal blocks. So when I take the whole trace, the trace for the whole, the complete representation, I just have to add the traces, obviously, for the irreducible representation. This is extremely important result. And this is obvious, completely obvious when you see an example as like this one. So going back to this. That's what I told you. Since V is the sum, direct sum of A1 plus E, then the character of V is just the sum of the characters for A1 and E. And you can check that this is true. The character for A1 is this vector because it's the six traces. The character for E is this vector, the six traces. If you add these two vectors, one plus two is three, one plus minus one is zero, et cetera, you see that this vector, each character is a vector, is the sum of these two vectors, okay? Uh, are there any questions so far? I mean, what I'm explaining today is a very basic, but also very important. So if anything is not crystal clear, please stop me and ask. Okay, now I'm defining what 
is meant by the class of a group. If you have studied any algebra, any elementary algebra in your first year or so, probably you are familiar with the concept of class in a group. But let me remind you and why this is important. Look at this. If you look at the traces, uh, these two elements always have the same trace. C3 plus and C3 minus always have the same trace for all the representations. If you consider these three elements, which are planes, uh, these three elements always have the same uh, character, the same, sorry, trace, okay? Now, these three elements happen to form a class. These two elements happen to form another class, and this is this element by itself is always a class in itself, okay? So what is a class? Well, the rough definition is that a class is a set of elements of the same kind, but this is rough and this is not accurate. For instance, here is the identity operation. There is nothing like the identity operation, it's the trivial operation, so it's always a class in itself, okay? These two things, both are rotations of 120 degrees. So in some sense, they are of the same kind. They are rotations by the same angle. So they can be in a class because they are of the same kind in this kind of loose sense, okay? These three things are mirrors. Moreover, they are vertical mirrors, reflection mirrors. So they are of the same kind, quote unquote, and they can be in a class, but that's not enough. To be in a class, it's not enough that they are of the same kind. There should exist elements that relate the elements of the class. For instance, if I take these three elements, remember these are three mirror planes at 180 degrees, they are related by a C3 rotation. If I take C sigma D1, which was parallel to the x-axis, these turns, if I rotate it 120 degrees counterclockwise, this becomes sigma d2. Now, these are operations. Remember that operations, always the transformation is by a similarity transformation. I have to act with an element and the inverse, okay? So in this case, they are of the same kind and they are related by C3 plus or C3 minus. So they belong to the same class, this class here. These two, one is clockwise and the other is counterclockwise. They are related by the mirrors. Remember that if I have a clockwise rotation, when I reflect it, it's a counterclockwise. You just have to reflect the rotation on a mirror. This is true only if the axis is parallel to the mirror, okay? If I have a rotation which is perpendicular to the mirror and I reflect it, it doesn't change the handedness, the handedness of the rotation. If it's clockwise, it's clockwise. If it's counterclockwise is counterclockwise. You can say that very easily. But this is an extremely important concept also, the concept of classes. Why? Because we can say that the traces are functions of classes. They always take the same value for the same elements in the, in the class. And in this sense, the characters are functions of class. They give one number for each class, okay? So what does it mean? means the following thing. It means that instead of taking all this table and giving the character this way, the character is the vector, eh? okay? Giving the traces this way, I give the trace for each element. I just can put these two elements together, these three elements together, and I can give a simple a table like this. Whenever you find a table in a book, they are always given this way. If you go to the BCS, the Bilbao Crystallographic Center, since they don't have a problem with the uh, size of pages and things like that, they don't have to save space, they give you this explicitly, okay? But in this Sorry. sense- Eventually, yes. I, I do have a question. What exactly um, of elements are you uh, having in this table? So on the uh, horizontal, there are this, uh, elements which the transformations are invariant to, but what is this um, A1, A2, and E exactly? Yeah, okay. Uh, let me, yeah, I have to, what is this I here, you mean, or? 
No, no, uh, the A1, A2, and E that you uh, have at the table. Okay, okay, the okay, 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 yeah, yeah, okay. These are, no, no, very good. These are the group elements, and these are irreducible representations, okay? Remember, irreducible representations are abstract representations. I mean, they are not associated to any particular system, but they satisfy the group property. So A1 of G1 times A1 of G2 is equal to A1 of the composition of G1 to G2. So these are uh, abstract representations, and these are the building blocks. Any other representation can be written as a sum of this, the of these representations, of an integral sum and with uh, whole numbers, positive whole numbers of this. So these are abstract representations and we are going to see in a minute a couple of theorems that tell you how many different representations you have for each group. And what is important is that for the group C3B or 3M, there are only three non-equivalent irreducible representations. In order to arrive at this result, you, you again need several theorems, several, several lemmas, which I'm not giving you, but you have this in the books and you don't really need to know how you prove this, although it's advisable to know it, okay? If you want to do this all the time. So these are irreducible representations. These are abstract objects. So it means that I can represent the elements of the group by one by one matrices, which have, which are this, or by two by two matrices that have these traces. Okay, I'm not giving the matrices here, but I gave the matrices a few, a few slides uh, earlier, okay? I have so, one more question. Yeah. Because now we have seen this character table and we know this, the, what the trace is because we have looked at the uh, representations, but do we know the trace even without a given representation? Or do we need always to know the representation then we can... Uh, no, that, that, that's, that's the important thing. You are anticipating the, what comes next, okay? Yes, in fact, as we'll see, it's very easy to compute the traces without knowing the explicit form for the matrices, okay? Not always, but in most cases, okay? In most cases, is, uh, that, that's possible. In the case of the irreducible representations, the way you know the traces is just because they are tabulated. You take any book on group theory that has tables, and you will find that for, C, for C3B, these are the three irreducible representations, and they have these traces. In the case of V, I'll teach you in a few minutes how to obtain this result without ever constructing the explicit matrices. So that's a very good question. I mean, that's the reason that group theory is so simple, that at the end, the actual computations are extremely, extremely easy to do and very, very basic, okay? Uh, but okay, so here, the point is that characters are function are of the class. So the traces change only when you change class, okay? For each element in the class, you only have one trace. And so this represents this class in an obvious way. This represents this class. I mean, if you go to the tables, they will tell you that I is X, Y, Z, or one, two, Z, okay? One, two, Z, or not X, Y, Z in this case, okay? So, and now you can observe that this is true. I told you this thing about the, the characters, okay? This is a one plus E, so one plus two is equal to three, one minus one is equal to zero, or one plus zero is equal to one, okay? How do we know that there are only three irreducible representations? Well, the most direct answer, you go to the tables and you see that there are only three. Uh, there are ways that you could do it from scratch, but since there are tables, why should you? Okay, they are based on several theorems. I'm going to give you just two of them. One of them is this, that the number of non-equivalent irreducible representations for a finite group is always equal to the number of classes. Okay, now in this group, sorry. In this group, there are three classes. Therefore, I know that there can only be three non-equivalent irreducible representations. Only three building blocks. That's extremely simple. Infinitely many 
different representations of any dimension, they can always be constructed like in a Lego game, Lego system, just from these three building blocks. That's extremely powerful. That's what makes uh, theory, uh, group theory powerful. And this is impossible to guess if you don't know group theory. You really need all the theorems and all this stuff. And there is another theorem. Sometimes this is called the Burnside theorem. It's actually a consequence of the orthogonality theorems that you may be studying already. And this is that the sum of the square of the dimensions of the non-equivalent irreducible representation of a finite group is always equal to the order of the group. The order of the group is by definition the number of elements. So I have C irreducible. If C is the number of classes, I have one, two, up to C irreducible representations. The squares of the dimension of the irreducible representation must add up to the number of elements in the group. In our case, the group is of order six. I have six elements, okay? I have these six elements, but only three classes. So I have three reducible representations and the sum of the square dimensions has to be equal to six. You will see that there is only one solution. Well, there are two solutions. One would be, no, no, there is only one because I need three numbers, three whole numbers, such that the squares add up to six. So this is one, one, two. There is no other possibility. For other groups, there are more possibilities and you need to use more powerful theory. In fact, you need uh, to deal, I mean, to deal with group theory quite deeply to be able to construct from scratch the reducible representations. You find that in many books, this is very well explained in the book by Lubarsky, for instance. If you read that, you would be able to construct uh, the tables, okay? But you never need that unless you are in a desert island and you, cannot, you don't have any information, okay? And now this is another extremely important thing. Today, everything is extremely important because it's the, the basic theory, the basic group theory. And the idea is the following. If you have two representations, not necessarily reducible, it can be any representations, we can define a scalar product. Remember that representations, each representation has associated, we can associate to it a vector, a six dimensional vector is just the set of traces. So if you have vectors, it's pretty natural and you can show that this, this really have a structure of vector space, which is not obvious, okay? But this can be shown. And if you have vectors, it's natural to try to define an inner product. Well, this inner product is the ordinary product, the ordinary product or Hermitian product. And it's just this. You just take the character, the classes, I mean, sorry, the traces, or the characters, which are just two vectors, and you take the Hermitian product, like in quantum mechanics, and you normalize it, dividing by the number of elements in the group. Okay? So I have defined a completely natural, almost obvious inner product for characters of representations. And this is valid, and this I can define both for irreducible and reducible representation. For any finite group, and that's the, the, the point, I can define this inner product, okay? For non-finite groups, like continuous groups, uh, this is not always possible, okay? It's possible for compact groups, compactly groups is not possible for non-compactly groups, and then you have a, a lot of very weird things, but we'll never deal with uh, such cases. And now, in these lectures, I will follow Lyubarsky and I use capital T for reducible representations and tau for irreducible representations. So if tau i and tau j are irreducible representations, then they are, the characters are orthonormal. Okay? If I take the corresponding vectors and I multiply them according to this rule, 
uh, they are one if I take the same representation or equivalent, of course, because if they are equivalent, they have the same character, and they are zero if they are different. So this is the most powerful theorem probably in group theory. The, is the called the orthogonality theorem for characters, okay? Is that clear? So let, let's check it. For instance, you take this as a vector and you take this as a vector, you take the ordinary inner product. In this case, I mean, these are real representations, so I don't have to take the complex conjugate. I don't need to. You see that this vector is orthogonal to this one. This one is orthogonal to this one. Two, et cetera, okay? If I, however, if I take this times itself, I have one plus one plus one, six times, I divide by n, that's the reason we divide by n, which is the order of the group, and I get one. Here is also true. Two squared is four plus one plus one. This is six. Divide by six is one. However, if I take this representation, which is reducible, I take the square of this. This gives me nine plus one plus one plus one. This gives me 12. 12 divided by two is equal, uh, sorry, by six is equal to two. So but there's no contradiction. This orthogonality theorem is valid only for irreducible representations. Okay. Any questions? Something very important. The scalar product I have to sum over all the elements of the group. So even though these two elements have exactly the same traces always, because they belong to the same class. I have to take this and take this, okay? I can do this just for one of them and multiply by two. I can do this just for one of them and multiply by three, okay? But the sum, which is also a very common mistake, is for over the elements of the group, not over classes, even if the traces are functions of classes, because they don't change when you move from one element to another element of the class, okay? And now this is the final result. Assume you have a reducible representation like this one. How do I decompose it into a sum of irreducible representations? Well, that's very simple from quantum mechanics or from linear algebra. I have a space and in this space, I have an orthonormal basis. Why is this orthonormal? Because of the orthonormality theorem, okay? This has norm one, norm one, norm one, but they are all, uh, the scalar product among themselves are zero. Why is this a basis? Well, because they are linearly independent, obviously, otherwise they couldn't be orthogonal. And also because their number is equal to the dimension of the space of characters. Characters are functions of classes, therefore I can only get three independent functions of classes. This is, if you don't understand this, don't worry, it's just to justify that this is a basis, okay? I mean, the characters of the irreducible representations are always a basis in the space of all possible characters, okay? Why? Because they are orthon orthonormal and because their number is equal to the dimension of the space of characters, okay? So then I can use what I use in linear algebra or in quantum mechanics. In quantum mechanics, if I have a vector, if I have a wave function and I want to decompose it in my basis, all I have to do is to take the inner product of the wave function with all the vectors of the basis. If I have a linear space, I just take the inner product with all the vectors in the orthonormal basis. And this gives me immediately the coefficients of the decomposition. So. If I have a reducible representation and I want to find a decomposition like this, where tau one, tau, one, tau c will be all the irreducible representation for the particular group. Of course, I have to find these coefficients. In quantum mechanics, these coefficients are in general complex numbers. Here they have to be, they have to be natural numbers because basically if I have three tau, three tau one, would, tau one, what I really mean is that 
if I find the appropriate basis, I will have three blocks, three diagonal blocks, each of them corresponding to this representation. I cannot have three and a half blocks, okay? I cannot have a negative number of blocks. So the multiplicities are always positive. That's what's peculiar about characters, okay? But now I know that if this is the relation for the representations, I have exactly the same relation for the characters. Why? Because remember, when I take the trace, the trace of the whole representation is the sum of the traces of the components, of the irreducible components. Therefore, I have this. And now, so basically, I want to find this. I want to express this character, the character of the representation T as a linear combination of the character of the irreducible representations, which are tabulated. If I find these coefficients, I find the multiplicities, which I, that's what I am looking for. So all I do is what I always do in either in linear algebra or in quantum mechanics. I just take the inner product of this times each of these characters by the orthogonality and by linearity, this is this, by orthogonality, this is delta ij, so this is directly the multiplicity. So the multiplicity, and that's all I need to know the decomposition, are just given by this very simple inner products. More explicitly, if I remember that this inner product is just this times this, and that I have to divide by m, this is the final formula for the multiplicities. This, is, this formula is so powerful, so incredibly powerful that many people call it the magic formula. This is really magic, okay? If you don't know the group theory, see what you have to do to find this decomposition. You will have to construct all the matrices and you'll need all eternity to try infinitely many uh, transformations to see if you hit one where all the matrices are block diagonal. And, uh, so if you know this formula, it takes a few seconds to find the decomposition, okay? So this is really magic. Okay, is that clear? Let's stop a minute here if you have any questions or because now we are just going to apply it. Okay, all the theory is here. If you want to know the proof of the theorem, you go to the books, but the, the basic theory is already here. I have eventually a stupid question and you just told it, but what are the keys? Is it the trace or what is it? Sorry? Say it again. I didn't know. Um, what are the keys? Uh, are, are they the trace or what are they? Oh, yes, yes, yes. The, these things, the, I don't know, it's called the chi or the, I don't know, the Greek letter, I think it's the chi. These are the characters. These are the characters. And remember that the characters, uh, these are the characters. Each character is a vector. I mean, this is the character for the representation A1. And what this really is, is the traces of the matrices of A1. These are the traces of the matrices of A2. And these are the traces of the matrices of E. So chi of E is this six dimensional vector. Chi of E will be this vector, okay? Chi, the character for V, will be this one. Is that, uh, does it answer the question? Okay, and by chi i, you just index uh, to the ith element. Uh, yeah, no, 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 no. This index, this index here, no, the elements. Uh, no, 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 no. This index goes, it doesn't go over the elements. This index is this one here. This index can be A1, A2, or E. The index goes over the irreducible representations, okay? Remember, for each representation, I have a vector, and this vector, and these three vectors are orthonormal vectors in a three-dimensional space, okay? So I goes over the three irreducible representations, okay? But now each of these vectors, each of these vectors, the components, there is one component for each element in the group. 
So you have here the elements of the group. For each element, one trace or one component of the trace, which is a vector. A tra uh, sorry, of the character. The character is a vector. It's, it is this set. And now there are three characters because there are three irreducible representations. So if I want to decompose V, I'm going to do this very explicitly. I have to multiply this vector by this one, the inner product. Okay. And this gives me how many times A1 is in V. Then I multiply this vector by this vector with the inner product, which carries, I mean, this just not just multiplying this by this by this, I have to divide by six, okay? And this number tells me how many times A1, A2 is in V. And now I do this, and this tells me how many times E is in V, okay? So, okay, but that, that's, that's a good question because, I mean, at this point you can get lost very easily because there are too many concepts. Yes, thanks. Okay, so uh, in this formula, the magic formula, M is one multiplicity. It tells you how many times the irreducible representation I is contained in T. The sum is over the elements of the group and J goes over the irreducible representations. The number of irreducible representations is the number of classes, okay? So let's see now this very explicit in the case of B. That's the way you will have the tables before you do your computation. This you will have taken from the tables. Today, I'm going to upload a set of tables where you will find, for instance, this in particular, okay? So this you take from the tables. This, so far, the only way to, go to, to obtain this is that you know is by constructing the matrices and taking the traces. But in a few minutes, you will be able to do this just in, 10, in 20 seconds by using a very basic formula, okay? So now I have to take, I have to use the, this formula. This formula is just taking the products of the scalar products of the characters times of for this times the characters for the others. And this is the, what you have to do. So for instance, if you want to compute how many times E is in V, you have to take the product of this character times this. And here you have to be careful because remember that this sum is over the group elements. So I take this trace times this trace. This is this three, sorry, for instance, I want to compute this multiplicity. So I take this trace times this one, three times two. Now I take this trace times this one, three times minus one. But remember, I have to sum not over classes, but over elements. So this result in this case is zero. I have to multiply by two because in this class, there are two elements. I just multiply because I know that all the traces are the same, but I have to remember this. This is also a very common mistake. And now if I want to compute this, I, will, I mean, the last one is this times this, but I have to multiply by three. So these factors are very important and you shouldn't forget them. Of course, if you use the complete table, then you don't have to worry about this. This is just two times three, minus one times one, minus one times zero, zero times one, zero. Times. But usually you don't have these tables so explicit. You only have tables for the characters, I mean, for the classes. And then you have to have in mind what the multiplicity is in each class. When I do computations myself, what I usually do is I write on top of this, the number of elements in the class. I use write a one here, a two here, and a three here. And then I know that I have to take the product, this by this, by the number of elements, okay? So is that completely clear? So you see that this is really a back of the envelope computation. And it's really simple. A six years old child can do it probably, or seven years, I don't know when they learn how to multiply and to divide, okay? Very simple. This multiplicity is one, this multiplicity is E, remembering that the multiplicities go here, is what multiplies the irreducible representations. That tells me that V is equal to E1 times E. So if somehow I'm able to compute these characters, this character, 
these traces, then it's trivial to obtain the decomposition. It's just this. <coughs> No, of course, the problem still, I mean, this is very simple, but it's not simple enough. Why? Because to obtain just these three numbers, three, zero, and one, I have to compute <coughs> six, three, sorry, six, three by three matrices. I'm going to take a two minutes break because I need some extra water because my throat is a bit ache. Just wait for me two minutes, I'll be back. Okay, so we will try to do that now is to find a way, a very efficient way to compute traces without compu computing matrices. Okay, so that's next. <coughs> well, if, if you know the matrices, it's trivial to take the characters. However, in practice, you don't need the actual matrices. Okay, basically you use two different tricks. First, characters are class functions. I mean, they take the same value. The trace take the, the traces take the same value for all the elements in the class. So basically, you choose the easiest element. If you really have to construct matrices, you only construct the matrices for the, the, the easiest matrix to construct in each class. That's one good thing to do. Okay. Now, the second thing is that traces are independent of the coordinates. So you can choose the most convenient coordinates for each element. So rather than choosing this just at, at, at the point of constructing traces from matrices, if you really want to construct matrices for some reason, you can always choose a coordinate system which is the best for the particular element that you are trying to construct, okay? So let's see this in practice. I mean, this is the vector representation. There are three classes for the identity. Well, the identity is trivial. The trace for the identity is always the, 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 the dimension because the identity is always represented by the identity element because it has to commute with all the elements. And so this is very simple, okay? 
No, for rotations, you can take either one. Both are very easy to construct because you, you probably all know this formula that for a rotation around the z-axis, here you have the cosine of the angle, here you have the cosine, here minus the sine, and here the sine, okay? In a minute, I, I will tell you how to obtain that formula from scratch. Is there one, and there are many ways. So this is easy to construct. And now out of these three, uh, of course, this is the easiest to construct. Why? Because in this case, sigma d1 is parallel to the x and the z axis. So the action is obvious. It just inverts the y coordinate and it doesn't do anything to the x and z coordinate because both x and z are parallel to this one, okay, to the mirror. So you construct this one. These are harder to construct, are not terribly hard. And in fact, the first exercise in the problem set would be to construct all of these matrices. But uh, you don't need to, okay? But now the good thing about the vector representation is that one can obtain general formulas which are valid for any group, okay? First, you have to know that for point groups, I mean, so far we haven't included translations. These groups are good for molecules. They are not good enough for crystals. So we have to include at some point translations and move from point groups to space groups. But point groups only have this, so these kinds of elements besides the identity, of course, okay? You have rotations. Z and rotation is a rotation by an angle two pi over n over some axis that usually you indicate here or, or here, okay? Then you have reflection planes. It's just reflection over a plane. Then you have the identity. And then you have roto reflections. Okay, you have to be careful with this because if you are using uh, this sunflies rotation, sunflies notation in sunflies notation, one speaks of roto reflections. If you use a crystallographic notation, then you speak of a roto inversions. So this is the product of a rotation times a reflection by a mirror perpendicular to the axis, okay? Let me try the blackboard to explain this and because I'm not sure if I don't write anything that you're going to see it. So I'm going to stop sharing this. And now I'm going to share. No, to, to turn on the camera. Okay. Uh, Maya, how do I get... I'm going to switch to talking about edge states and then back up to talking about more physics of, of yes. integer quantum Hall effect. Sorry, I don't understand. Uh, Maya, how do, how, are you getting the screen? I mean, I just get a very tiny screen here. Do you get a big screen with my? Yes, if you, if you go to the right, yes, uh, there is um, a window that says view like key oh uh, yes 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 okay. there you can change to speaker or to gallery okay so if you change I, to speaker you get the big view okay uh, okay i see but in my case i, I get the, the gallery by default in your case you get the okay so you get the whole field okay is yes, yes. Right? okay so uh, roto reflection is the following thing i have a axis and i have some rotation around the axis, okay? For instance, it can be, a, this would be 120 rotations counterclockwise around the C axis. So this is a reflection. Now I take a mirror plane, which is perpendicular to the axis. So basically, if I have a vector, first I rotate it. I think point for a vector. First I rotate it and then I reflect it. Okay. So this is a roto reflection, and I call this thing S3C, for instance. General S3. So this is a roto reflection. 
Okay, there is a, so it's not clear. First I rotate and then I reflect. There is a nice way to represent this, which is very much used by crystallographers, and this is the following. One draws a circle like this. This means that I have uh, three axes, and then I take a, a point, and if I write like this, this means that this is above the plane of the black ball. So if I apply a C3, this goes to this point. If now I reflect it, this goes to this. So this way I can represent very easily, and this is useful sometimes when you want to understand how a group works. I can represent the action of C. This means, this plus means that this is counterclockwise. So I rotate like this and then I reflect, okay? So that's what I mean by a rotor reflection. This is the fourth kind of elements that you can find in a point group. If you use crystallographic notation, then instead of speaking of this group, you speak of this one, you may be familiar with this. That's also called international rotation, uh, international notation, officially crystallographic notation. Uh, this will be written like this. We'll see this because that's the notation used in the Bilbao crystallographic server. So both notations mean the, mean the same, sorry, this is zero, one. This, mean, this gives the axis and this is the way counterclockwise. Okay. Now the point is that with this notation, one doesn't use rotor reflections. One uses rotor inversion. This means that you apply first a rotation and then an inversion. So what is an inversion? An inversion is something that changes all the coordinates. Vector of the point. So for instance, if I have a point here above the, black, the bore plane, this takes me to the opposite point below, under here, okay? So this is a reflection. This cross indicates that this is under the plane. So what is a rotation like this? Rotation like this, rotor, reflect, rotor inversion would be, I take this, I rotate, if I rotate, I come to this point, and now I reflect it. Oh, sorry, I impact it. So in general, what I see is that this is equal to this. So, if I want to obtain this as a rotation plus a reflection, I have to take a rotation clockwise. So this is the general relation between the elements. When you do the exercises, uh, you, you have to take care about these things. Is that more or less clear? No. You can find this on any books and that's perfect. This is the idea, okay? So, uh, If you don't have any question regarding this, I'll go back to the presentation. But this only holds for free rotation systems, so only for, for uh, systems that are invariant under 120 degrees, right? Yes, but no, 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 but this is, this is always true. For instance, if I do, no, no, this is always true. For instance, something that we'll use are for four rotations, in this case, point we'll go like this, and then upon reflection, I will get this. Okay, so this would be the result of using C for Z plus. If I use for plus with inversion, I will go to this and then I invert, which is the same as taking a rotation like this and then a reflection. So again here for this 
cross z is equal to s or minus. Okay, so this is this is a general thing, but, but this is a property. So no, no, this is, this is fairly general. Okay, but you should be careful because depending on, on the set of tables, some tables, the ones we are going to use are from Bradley and. I mean, they are based on some flies rotation, so they use rotor action all the time. But if you go to the below crystallographic center server, you use another uh, notation, the other notation, so it has to be careful. Uh, okay. So, are you seeing the slide right now? Yeah, oh, I, I forgot to. Okay. So, now, there are only four kinds of elements here. And now, in one of the exercises, you will find these formulas here. Okay? They are very easy to, to obtain. I mean, it's always the trick choose the appropriate coordinate system. Okay? If you choose the appropriate coordinate system, since you know that the result is independent of the system, you find immediately these general formulas. For instance, this is very easy to get to see. If you take your element, your axis, rotation axis along the z axis, you know that you have on the diagonal cosine, cosine, and then a one. So immediately it gives you this. Okay. So this immediately with a constructing any matrix, if you know this formula, you immediately know the character for the vector representation. So using these formulas, immediately you obtain the C, three, zero, one. So you really have almost nothing to do. No matrices, just directly you obtain this result, okay? I'll give you a summary at the end. In the last slide will be a summary of all these formulas. Another representation, which is very important, is the uh, rotational. I mean, there is a type of here. This will be pseudo vector. I'll try to correct this. Uh, it tells you how axial vectors or pseudo vectors transform, okay? Uh, pseudo vectors are, for instance, uh, magnetic field, uh, angular momentum, uh, for uh, magnetization, etc. Okay. Usually, axial vectors can be written as the vector product of two vectors. That's the reason they behave differently. So, axial vectors transform like vectors under rotations, but have a relative minus sign under improper operations. Okay. This is just because uh, under inversion, a vector changes sign. Under inversion, a pseudo vector doesn't change sign. For instance, if I take the angular momentum, the angular momentum is the vector product of R, the, vector posi the position vector times P, the momentum. Inversion inverts R and P, but the two minus signs cancel and L is not in, it doesn't change under the inversion. Since all the improper, um, improper operations can be found as the inversion multiplying something, as you will see in the exercises, then this is the general rule. So immediately from the previous table, from the previous chart of formulas, from this, I just have to add a global minus sign here and here, and I get the table of the rotational symmetry. Okay, which is like this. This you know, or you have somewhere, and but then, both representations are very simple to construct. So now here comes the last thing for today, which is how to construct the mechanical representation. That seems a lot harder because to begin with it has a high dimension. For instance, for the molecule we are considering is a 15 dimensional representation. I have to construct 15 by 15 matrices. However, we'll see that the formula for the character is extremely simple. So I'll do it uh, step by step. The mechanical representation tells how general mechanical deformations of a molecule transform. So first, let's draw the molecule. 
Well, no, okay, before that, I forgot. Uh, the matrices for the mechanical representation have a block structure where the blocks are just the matrices of the vector representation. So let's see why. Uh, this represents the deuterate methane molecule. This will be the three vertices which are on the basis plane. This is the upper vertex, which is on top of everything. And in the middle is the carbon atom. And these are the three mirror planes, okay? So first let's place the carbon atom. Here it is, okay? That's in the middle of the uh, molecule. Now let's place the four, the three hydrogens and the deuterium atom. These th the three hydrogen atoms are on the basis vertices, of the, of the horizontal plane, and this one is at the top vertex. So this is on top of the carbon. That's why you don't see the carbon very well now, okay? Now, a general displacement of the molecule is given by this 15 dimensional vector. I just have to give a vector that tells me how much this is displaced, how much this one, how much this one, these are the first three, then the deuterium, this is U4, and finally the carbon atom. Okay, so this is a general vector in our linear space, okay? And on this 15 dimensional linear space is defined the mechanical representation. So for each group element, I have a 15 by 15 matrix element. But as we'll see, they are trivial to construct. Even if you don't need them to construct them, if you sometimes you want for fun, they are very easy to construct. And you will do that in one exercise or two in the problem set. So what is the action of the group elements on this kind of vector. This vector tells me all the displacements. What happens, for instance, if I rotate the molecule counterclockwise by 120 degrees? <coughs> well, the first thing you have to note is that some atoms are exchanged. For instance, Atom one now becomes atom two. Atom two becomes atom three, etc. There is a permutation action of the group element. Okay. Other atoms are invariant. I mean, these atoms are rotated about themselves, but they stay the same atom. Okay. That's the first action. It's a permutation of the atoms in the molecule. The second action is that the displacements are rotated. For instance, if this atom is rotated, initially is displaced like this, assume that H1 has a displacement parallel to the, to the X axis. Now what happens? This, when I rotate the molecule with this displacement, this displacement now is a displacement for H2 because this comes, comes to this point. And also, this displacement, which was pointing in the x direction, now is pointing in this direction. So the mechanical representation, in fact, has two ingredients or two components. One permutation of atoms, that's one component of the action. Atoms are permute by this. And the other element, the other essential element, is that these vectors are rotated and vectors are rotated by the vector representation. So this immediately tells you, well, that if you want to construct, I mean, U is this vector, the original vector, and this is the vector after the symmetry operation. And they are related by a matrix 15 by 15. Well, you, it's obvious that this is, for instance, the matrix for C3 plus. Why is that? It's very easy to understand. C3 plus rotates the molecule by 120 degrees. So all the displacements are rotated by V of C3 plus, which is a three by three matrix. So basically I just have to place the vector representation 
somewhere I have to distribute it among the entries for the M because one action is just a rotation. Why do they have to be exactly this way? Well, see, for instance, that the atom H3, after I rotate it, becomes the atom H1. So it's, it means that if I place an arrow here, which is U3, this arrow now is going to describe after rotation, the displacement of atom one. So it means that U1 prime is going to be equal to U3 rotated by the vector representation. So if I place here, you see this would be, this would, that would act on U1, U2, U3, U4, U, UC. If I look at U3, which is the displacement for this atom, this would be here. At, after I multiply by this, you see that this will become the displacement. This is the first row. So this will become U1 prime that would be here. So U1 prime is going to be equal to V of C3 plus multiplying U3. And that's exactly what I should get. Why? Because if I have here some U3, this goes to this point. So this becomes a U1, but it's rotated in the process. So this is the structure for the mechanical representation for this. I don't know if it's what I said is completely clear. If you want any clarification, I can also try to do it on the blackboard. I mean, this is something that you should do at home. It's the only way to learn, but I just want to give you enough hints so that you can do it. So is that clear enough or? So it's a, it's a kind of mental exercise where I permute atoms and I rotate fields. So you have to construct the metrics so that this thing works. So for instance, if a displacement of atom three becomes a displacement of atom one, it means that column three, the entry has to be in, in position one. If atoms, if atom, a displacement of atom two becomes a displacement of atom three, it just means that column two, because of these two, the, 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 this has to be in row, in the third row, okay? So that's the general rule. Uh, you can do this also for other operations. For instance, sigma d1, or, or the only thing you have to see is how atoms are permute. So basically, you see that in this case, there are three atoms that stay the same, which are one, four, and the carbon. So this means that this would be at the diagonal, one, one, because one goes to one, four goes to four, this would also be at the diagonal, and finally, carbon goes to carbon. Well, carbon always stays the same. So I get this structure, okay? And now here is the key observation. This is the structure, but what I really want is the trace, okay? So what is the trace of this matrix? Well, if I take the diagonal, the trace is going to be the trace of V, of the vector representation, which I know how to compute, times three. Why? Because there are three blocks in the diagonal. And why are there three blocks in the diagonal? Because there are only three invariant atoms. Under this mirror symmetry, only this, this, and this stay the same. So you see that the character for M, I mean the trace of M for this element is just three times the trace of V for that element. And now you know the general rule. How are the traces of the mechanical and the vector representation related? Well, by a simple rule. The trace of the mechanical representation, I compute by looking at how many blocks are in the diagonal and at the number, that number three, I just multiply by the trace of V. 
and the number of blocks is just the number of invariant atoms. So I arrive at this extremely simple conclusion. The matrices for the mechanical representation have a block structure where the blocks are just the matrices of the vector representation. The blocks are on the diagonal when the corresponding atoms are invariant at the symmetry operation. And only blocks on the diagonal can contribute, obviously. I mean, this doesn't contribute to the trace, this doesn't contribute to the trace. Therefore, the character of the mechanical representation I just obtained by multiplying for each element, the character of the vector representation times the number of invariant atoms for that element. And that's all. So I forgot about the 15 by 15 matrices of all the complications, and I just have this extremely simple formula. In this case, all I have to do is to construct this table for each class, because I know that everything is a function of the class. The character has to be a function of the class, so I don't care. And I can see, of course, that the number of invariant elements is a function of class. Obviously, for the identity operation, all four atoms are invariant. For the rotations, only the two atoms, which are in the rotation axis, are invariant. So this number is two. For the planes, only, I mean, there are three atoms on each plane. For instance, for sigma d1, this, this, and this, and for the others, different, but only three. And that, for, to compute the mechanical representation, if I know the vector representation, everything reduces to looking at the molecule and writing down these, these numbers. It's just by looking at the molecule. It's as complicated as that. Okay, any questions up to this point? I mean, today, most concepts are very simple, but there are many concepts, so it's easy to get lost, okay? So, in this case, this will be the operations. This three irreducible representation, I look up the tables. The tables give me the characters. For the vector representation, I use the general formulas. That gives me, I don't construct any matrix, the general formulas. Three, zero, and one. Now, for the mechanical representation, I need the number of invariant atoms. Five, two, and three. So the mechanical representation, I just construct by multiplying three times five, 15. Zero times two, zero. One times three, three. So this multiplication and this observation is all I need instead of constructing, of, of constructing the 15 matrices, okay? So this is really simple. And now I just use the magic formula. I use the magic formula. I multiply, for instance, if I want to know how many times A1 is contained, 15 times one, there is only one element in the class, zero times one times two, because there are two elements in the class, three times one times three, because there are three elements in the class. I get these three things and I get this decomposition. So you see that the mechanical decomposition can take about five minutes to, to compute, 10 minutes uh, if, if you have to do uh, this previously. But uh, it's really uh, very simple and takes no space, okay? So now we have everything. This we have done explicitly. This we haven't done explicitly, but you will do in, we will do in an exercise. You construct these characters by using the general formula for the characters and you decompose by the magic formula. This we just compute. And now, since from the mechanical representations, from the, all the deformations, I have to eliminate the deformations, which are rigid rotations or rigid translations because there are no vibrations, I just subtract. I take away the corresponding subspaces. I mean, in this 15 dimensional space, there, are, there is one subspace, and we'll construct that explicitly the next class, I mean, next lecture, uh, next week. Uh, 
there is one subspace that describes the uniform translations. Since they transform like vectors, I just subtract this from here. There is another subspace which transforms like uh, rigid rotations. Since rigid rotations transform like the like axial vectors, I subtract this and I get my final result. From the dimensions, I get the spectrum, the form of the spectrum. Okay, so now you know how to compute, how to obtain all the information about the uh, vibrational spectrum of, in principle, any molecule by using these things. This is the summary. Uh, remember, we have these formulas for computing the character of the vector representation. With this, I compute the character of the rotation representation. And with this, finally, the character of the mechanical representation. Then, by using the magic formula, I obtain this, this and this. And by subtracting, I obtain this and the spectrum, okay? So, okay, that's the end of today's lecture. Uh, it's already 15 plus, plus, uh, past one. If you have any question, uh, I'm going to upload today, besides, besides the slides, I'm going to upload a table. And on this table, you'll have the irreducible representations for all the point groups. And also you'll have a description of all the elements of the point groups. Uh, I, I will comment on this uh, next time. And also uh, the problem set. Uh, you should be able to do all the problems in the, all the exercises, except maybe the last one. The last one, there is something which I haven't had time to explain to you, but how to use the tables for groups which are direct product of other groups. So you can do part of the last exercise and at the beginning of the next lecture, I clarify how you use the tables for that. I, I'm sorry, but I, I didn't have time today. So uh, if you have any questions now, you can ask them. Are there any questions? Okay, if not, we close the session and we meet again uh, next Wednesday. Okay, let, let me 